Good morning. morning. Welcome to our worship at St. Paul this morning. Good to be with you here in God's house. Pray you are enjoying the, the beautiful days that we're having in this summer season. We get to have the doors open uh, in the back for, for church. And uh, you, you don't get to see this. I get to see this as uh, a pastor every once in a while. Um, because of the music and, and just having the doors open, people who are walking by the sidewalk will just walk up the steps, stop in. Sometimes they'll sit down for five to ten minutes, join us in our service, and then go on their way and, and, uh, and take a rest of their walk down the sidewalk. And so it's a joy to have those opportunities, experiences. And, uh, and now we have a few people in the you know, back, like, like Zach and Fred, who can help say, oh, hello, can I help you? Or we're St. Paul, good to meet you. You know, and just make those community connections. Uh, so thank the Lord. We have beautiful weather today to get to do that again. We get to gather around the, um, the service of Matins this morning as we sing and respond with uh, sections from God's word. And so I uh, rejoice with you that God gives us his word to speak back to him. Let's stand as we begin with our first hymn this morning on Galilee's High Mountain, number 835. Open my lips. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Son and the Holy Spirit.
Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Please be seated as we hear from God's Word. A reading from the book of Acts. Now, there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called for them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elmias, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at them and said, You, son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately, mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed. When he, saw that, what, when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand as we hear the words of Jesus. Our gospel reading for this morning comes from Matthew chapter 11. At that time, Jesus declared... I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and have revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me. All who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated as we sing our sermon hymn, number 831, stanzas 1 through 3.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to take a moment this morning to, to reflect on some turning points in, in your spiritual life, in your relationship with God. So we're going to start here in, in just a moment. Now for some of you, this kind of exercise is going to be extremely easy because um, you've had lots of experience and you can recall multiple times where God has encountered you with his mercy where God has maybe even knocked you over the head and, and helped you to see those spots where you need to repent. For others, this might be a little more difficult. Maybe you're not used to the, the practice of spiritual autobiography, perhaps. Or maybe you're just younger and it's harder to see the, um, your, your narrative in light of God and his word. I, I think this is a worthwhile task regardless. It is because... It's one in which we, we see that our God is not, a, it's not a, a dead God of the past, but one who is living and active in our own lives, who continues to bring us his word that changes our hearts and changes our lives. Now, before I, I ask you to, to take a minute to, to talk to a, a pew mate, let me give you an example of, um, of one in my own life. So it was my first year of, of seminary, and uh, I was encountered uh, by God through Luther's Galatians commentary. It's, it's one of those things where it's a very a theologian thing to, to be <laughs> encountered by, I, I think. But it was certainly an encounter. I was something I had not expected. And I, I remember like, reading Luther's Galatians commentary, just recognizing the gravity of what Jesus had done for me in this whole new way that, that I had not quite gotten before. And, and this, this grace of God that, that struck me here, it was both heavy and light at the same time. It, it was heavy in recognizing that Jesus did all this for me. It was my sin that put him on the cross. And yet, he did it not just because of me, but for me. And so it was also light in realizing just what my Lord, how much he loves me and what he has done even for me. And then also at the same point, this grace, it gave me this burning desire to share Jesus with others. I felt like the prophet Jeremiah, where he says, there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. Now you'll notice this turning point, it came after I entered seminary. This is significant because it came to me, if I remember correctly, the, the first quarter in which I was, I was called to stand in a pulpit the first time, and it wasn't before I did, it was after. And that means, by the way, that, that I really felt equipped to, uh, to be a pastor. It would have been only months after I actually had been in the seminary. I think God had laid before me all kinds of things, of which um, certainly at times felt like too much. All right, so that, that's my turning point example for you. Now, what I want you to do is to take one minute. I know it's not nearly enough time, um, but we'll, we'll go about a minute, maybe a minute and a half, and share with someone in a pew something in your own life, a kind of turning point here. All right, go for it. And I'll set a timer to keep me on track. Thank you so much for sharing. I, I, hopefully, this is something, too, that can uh, propel you into some conversations later today. I know that one of the most fun things last night, my, my family was here um, last night and talking to, to my daughter anyway, um, 
after church about what she was thinking and doing was just one of, one of my most fun parts of, of last evening. So I hope you get that experience too. But, but I start with turning points here um, for, for two reasons. And the first is that we recognize, as I said before, it is our God who is living and active, right? He's continually working within our lives and on our hearts by his word. So I've started to do, doing the, the Lectio 365 devotions recommended by our own Pastor Ragao here. And in the evening, they ask these two questions, which I think is part of what in, inspired me here. They ask, uh, over today, in the evening, each evening, in what ways did I experience God's goodness today? And when did I hear him speak? And that's what thinking about our own turning points helps us to do too, I think, is to discern how God is good, for he certainly is, but to discern how he is in my life. Not just in some generic way, but concretely for me. And then see how his word is speaking to me um, also, speaking to my life. And then secondly, I bring up turning points because that's really what we're looking at in the life of the Apostle Paul today, though maybe it's not so obvious at first glance. Last Sunday was the obvious one. We we saw Paul's conversion, where God came to him on the road to Damascus, struck him blind, and turned him all around. That was the big turning point that we know about. But this one today is also one, but much more subtle, as as we'll get there in a moment. Up to this point in in the story, in, in Acts, Saul has actually not played a big part in the life of God's people. In short, he is not the Paul that you know him to be in the rest of Holy Scripture. Um, In fact, Saul couldn't join the disciples until it was Barnabas who trusted enough to to usher him along and bring him into the group of the apostles. So if you want to follow along with me, we're actually going to be stepping through the the text a little bit, and so it might be helpful to have your bulletin open and uh, follow along with me as we look through um, the Scripture text together. Notice what happens at the beginning of chapter 13 in verse 1. We would expect that, like, Saul would be named first, right? I mean, he's the big name here, right? But notice, we've got the, at Antioch, prophets and teachers. Where do you see Saul? He's named last, right? You've got Barnabas first, and then you list uh, Simeon, Lucius, Menaean, and then last, Saul. And then, of course, in all the groupings, Um, Who do you have listed first? It's Barnabas and Saul, right? And each one of these. Saul, in short, he's come to faith in Jesus, but he's not that Paul that we know him to be. And then in verse 2 here, we've got the church gathered for worship, and the Holy Spirit speaks to the church at Antioch, designating that Barnabas and Saul are here to be sent off for the mission of God. And we don't know exactly how they heard the, the Spirit speak. It might have been through the voice of a preacher, it may have been in reading the scriptures together that they came to see what God was, was calling them to do here in his mission. It may have been an audible voice. We don't know. But we do know that God is Lord of his church. And we also know that to be his church means to be on his mission. And so right here in our reading, God is taking charge of his church and sending them out, sending Barnabas and Saul to go to Cyprus and Asia Minor. And then you'll see in verse 3, As these two are going from Antioch, verse 3 shows us the way in which they do not go alone. And I'm not just talking about John Mark, who obviously goes with them, but rather, notice the church laying their hands upon Barnabas and Saul here. And in doing this, the church of Antioch, they're not only designating them as the ones who are going on this mission, though that's part of it, but they're also saying that the whole congregation is doing this work together through these two. It's as if the congregation of Antioch said to Barnabas and Saul, this is not your work alone. This is our work, and you two are are going as as part of us, certainly, but also to represent us as you go forth on God's mission. And that same thing is true for us here at St. Paul. Whether we're talking about teachers or or pastors or others like Pastor Schultz, who we are going to be um, designating today towards the same kind of task. They stand on our behalf as they go and minister, even as they also stand on God's behalf, too, as they minister to us and others. Then, having been sent by the church of Antioch, Barnabas and Saul, they go with John Mark to Cyprus. Cyprus, one of um, of the biggest islands in the eastern Mediterranean. When they arrived at the port of Salamis, that happens in verse 5, you can see here, um, they, they went to the synagogue first to proclaim Jesus as the Messiah of Israel. Going, um, 
going here first to the synagogue, which will become Paul's usual method along all these missionary journeys. Right? Always first to the synagogue where they will proclaim Jesus as the Messiah of Israel. I think this is especially instructive for us. Um, because when we think of mission, my, my sense is that we tend to think of these big, almost impossible things. Right? So I, I've got to go like, up, uproot my family, go across the seas, and go do missions so far away. I've got to do something that's brand new and often looks so big and scary, and then we don't do anything at all. Now, of course, it can be overseas, like Pastor Schultz is doing here soon, but it does not have to be. I mean, notice how Barnabas and Saul, they, they start here with something they understand, right? And people who would understand them. I mean, they were Jews. They knew synagogue life, and so they went there. They went to proclaim to other Jews that Jesus is the long-promised Messiah. Our work of mission will be harder in some ways. We don't really have a natural place where Jesus as the Messiah makes um, a, a lot of sense to people. But what we do have are our neighbors, friends, family, even co-workers who don't know Jesus. But they know you. We know them. And with them, we already have a kind of community to which God can and does call us. Um, evangelism doesn't mean talking to people we've never met then. Right? But most of the time, it, I think, it's really just having real conversations with people in our spaces, within our communities. Talking to people about the real things like death, suffering, loneliness, forgiveness, new life, things like that. And when we're having these kind of real conversations with people who aren't Christians, how can we do anything other than talk about our Savior Jesus? The one who conquered death by his death and resurrection. The one who has promised to be with us in the middle of our suffering and our loneliness, who will never leave us nor forsake us. The one who has given us promise of forgiveness of sins for our guilt and our shame. Right? These are promises that we have that we can and that we do hold on to and that we can share with others too. It's really in verse 6 where the story gets, I think, very interesting here. So Barnabas and Saul, they've gone now through the whole island of Cyprus. They've gone from the far eastern side, where they, when they landed at Salamis, now to the far western side, to Paphos. And here, they're actually summoned to meet the Roman leader of the province of Cyprus, to meet the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. Now, Sergius Paulus, he's apparently heard, he's paying attention, right? He's heard about these messengers who have come and are delivering a new kind of, of message. And he asks them to come and give this word to himself. Now, here, Barnabas and Saul have this wonderful opportunity, right? a wonderful opportunity to proclaim the gospel and to win an important convert to faith in Jesus. And immediately, opposition arises. That's, I think, how it often is, friends. Right, wherever, wherever the gospel begins to get a foothold, Satan is right there to oppose it. It's why the devil and, and his minions show up so clearly in the New Testament and in the book of Acts. Um, where the gospel is being proclaimed, the evil one is there to tempt and entice away from the good news. Now here in Acts, Satan has been at work through a, a false prophet named Bar-Jesus. Oh, and he was working to turn Sergius Paulus away from this gospel message. Luke tells us that the false prophet is also named um, Elamos, and he's a magician. We get almost no details here, right? We, we wish we could, like, see the inner workings of what is happening. How does this work? Um, I know that's what, that's what I want when I'm, I'm reading this text, but Luke doesn't give it to us. Instead, all we pretty much know is that Elamos is opposing Barnabas and Saul before into the face of Sergius Paulus. That's about all we know. But in this moment, something big happens. But Luke almost disguises it for us. It's this big turning point in Saul's life. It happens in verse 9. Notice what it says here. Uh, let's just read it. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, do you see what Luke is doing so subtly here? Up to this point, do you, do you know what he has called him every time? Saul. And here, all he tells us, he's also called Paul. And from here on out, do you know what he'll call him every single time? Paul. So Luke has this just abrupt change. He says Saul, he's also called Paul, and he will never call him Saul again. 
every time. Say, okay, so what, what big thing is happening here? Remember, Saul to this point, he's always been playing like kind of second chair, right? Second fiddle, if you will. Um, and Barnabas has been the leader. But in this moment, in the midst of opposition, it's Saul who is filled with the Holy Spirit and Saul who steps in front of Barnabas and who speaks the word of God powerfully uh, before Sergius Paulus and to Elymas, uh, the magician. And he speaks these clear words, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness. Will you stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And then Paul calls down God's judgment upon Elamas, and, and he goes blind for a time. And it's here with this demonstration of power, along with the preaching of the gospel, that the proconsul Sergius Paulus comes to believe in Jesus Christ. And now you have this Roman leader, or right, one who is in charge of a province in Rome, one who has to actually affirm in a certain sense that Caesar is Lord. He actually knows the true Lord of all. Jesus Christ, the crucified and risen one. And notice also that God doesn't equip Paul before he faced the opposition, but only right here in the middle of it. Only in the presence of this enemy, the magician, that Paul's lips are loosed and that he steps out to be the leader that we know him to be in the rest of the book. And I think this is one of the most challenging parts of being on God's mission. You know, I for, I for one, and I suspect you too, we'd like to have it all kind of planned out beforehand. I want to know what's going to happen, and I want to have all my answers kind of set up, and I want to know where the trouble's going to be, and I want to be ready for it. I want to be equipped before I'm called. But friends, that's not how it works. Our Lord promises us instead that he's going to be with us in the middle of the opposition and he's going to give us words to say. Right? Jesus promises in Luke, for instance, when you're before synagogues and rulers and authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you are to say. And friends, that was certainly true for St. Paul. But it's also a promise for you and for me. I think the hard part is well, believing it. We want to rely on our own intelligence, on our own eloquence, on our own strength, but none of those things is the power of the gospel. I, I, I am convinced that if we will step out in faith to have some of those challenging conversations with those we know who are not Christians, we will find the Holy Spirit is leading those conversations. That doesn't mean we're going to be eloquent, actually. It doesn't mean we're going to say the right things according to our own judgment. You will still feel silly and uncomfortable at times. But what it does mean is that the Holy Spirit will be at work through you, through your words, through your actions, to lead others to see this gospel of Jesus Christ, the one that has already grasped you, this gospel that you know and love already, and you can bring others to see as well. Because, friends, I think that really is the biggest key. For us to remember that um, when, we're talking about, um, when we're talking about evangelism or witness, we're not worrying about our own appearance, our own power. We're keeping our eyes on Jesus, recognizing that he is our great God. He is the one who gave up his life for us. He is the one who died on our behalf and God raised from the dead to give us forgiveness of sins and, res and the hope of the resurrection of the dead. And this same Jesus, he's the one who loves you and will never leave you nor forsake you, whether in life or in death. You've been grasped by this message and it has changed your life. I know it has changed mine. Our turning points, they may not look quite as powerful as we see here in Paul, but they are just as powerfully God's work to encounter us with Christ's forgiveness to change our hearts, to know his grace, and to equip us. Equip us for what he has in store for us, even in the midst of opposition. This is it's a beautiful message that you and I have the privilege to, to share. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, please rise as we sing a, a hymn verse in response to the word of God.
Please be seated as we now worship with our gifts, returning them to the Lord's use as he has given them to us. I also ask you to take the black folders that are on the center aisle here on the side of the pew and uh, let us know that you're here today. Update any information that would be helpful in us connecting with you as we share together in this body of Christ. to invite Charles to come forward for his commissioning. Charles, uh, as we have been reading and, and singing today, this is like a, a service for all of us, certainly, but uh, particularly speaks to the mission and ministry that you are being sent out on to go across the sea and, uh, and share Christ with others. And uh, we, even, we even sang in this hymn, it, it made me think of what God is using you to do. And uh, when we sang how shall they hear to all the world to every place neighbors and friends and far off lands preach the good news of saving grace go while the great commission stands and uh thank you pastor hopkins for reminding us that we don't need to go to far off lands uh to do that to do that wherever christ sends us in our own uh communities uh, but some he does send to distant places, like he sent Paul and Barnabas. He's also sending you, Charles. And so we look forward to hearing the good news of God's work through you. God bless you as you do that. We're going to commission you in that service today. So, brother in Christ, you are to serve our Lord with the Lutheran Heritage Foundation, teaching at Concordia Lutheran Institute for the Holy Ministry in South Sudan, Africa. Hear what Holy Scripture has to say about those who serve in the church. Paul says in Romans, By the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. And also the, to the Colossians, Paul writes, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which you indeed were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, 
Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And so, Charles, in the presence of God and of this congregation, I commission you to, to speak to those in South Sudan the message of Christ in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, through your dear Son, you have made us all your witnesses. Enlightened by your Holy Spirit, all who speak to others, that message of salvation through Jesus' blood and merit. Today, we pray that you would give your blessing to Charles so that your word may reach out and bear much fruit for the growth of your church in South Sudan. We pray this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So Charles, go in the name of the Lord. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. The Almighty and merciful God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. Go in peace, brother. I invite you to please stand as we join together in prayer.
Lord be with you. God invites us to approach his heavenly throne with all our needs. We come without fear at his invitation. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, your faithful servants Saul and Barnabas sought not their own renown, but being sent out by your Holy Spirit, began their ministry together, proclaiming the word of God in the synagogues. And grant that we may follow their example of obedience, trusting the power of the Holy Spirit to work faith, even in the midst of opposition. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Mighty God, day by day, you make sure that birds are fed, and the lilies of the field are clothed in splendor. We ask that you would deliver us from worry, knowing that you know what we need in our bodies and our souls, and that for Jesus' sake, we are so much more of value than they. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father, kindle in us your Holy Spirit, that we may daily be encouraged by each other's faith. Daily speak to us your word of grace as we dive into your word. Lord, in your mercy. God, we ask that you would fill our homes with your word and grace. Be the companion of those who are single, widowed, and homebound. We pray that you would strengthen husbands and wives together. Bless parents as they teach their children your word. And let them all find refuge in you. Preserve them from every evil. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, be with all who are weary and heavy laden, who suffer from the tribulations of this life. We ask that you would watch over those we know with cancer, like Nola and Greg, Peggy, Harry, Leo, and Beth, Bethany and Eric, Virginia, Ken, Shireen, Deanna, Tyler, Stephen, and Patty. Lord, continue to work through their treatments and give them healing to your, according to your will. We also ask that you would be in the recovery of Bill and Kathy, Donnie Joe, Mark and Steve, Ron, Kathy, Jennifer and Helga, and continue to walk with those with long-term health issues like Ernest and Larry, Luella and Alexandra, Sally, Jim and Mike, Gordon, Mary and Shirley. Console them with the knowledge that your yoke is easy and your burden is light and that in you they will find rest for their souls. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we rejoice with those who rejoice, and we thank you for 66 years of marriage that you have given to Harry and Marge Kip Miller. Lord, continue to walk with them daily as they find their, their relationship and their hope that is bound up, centered in you. Lord, we pray that you would continue to draw us to yourself daily so that with all your saints we attain the promised inheritance that you have for us in the new creation. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you've safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power and grant that this day we fall into no sin, 
nor run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings being ordered by your governance may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Let us bless the Lord. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. One quick announcement, just to uh, give you a heads up, kind of a, a midsummer update. There um, is a capital campaign update that was sent in Friday's E News. If you're uh, on the email list for our E News, you would have uh, received that. If you didn't get a chance to read that email yet, go through that and check out the update on what's going on with that capital campaign. And uh, if you want to grab one, there are some paper copies available in the in the back and on the side here on your way out and uh, see what the next steps are that we're going forward in that. We've got a, um, a logo now to go with that, so that'll give you a heads up to recognize that and, and see news for that capital campaign coming forward. Also, uh, Zach is our elder today, and so he'll be up here after the service. If you have any prayer requests for yourself or others, he'd love to also join with you in prayer. We go with the Lord's blessing. Know that the Holy Spirit is with us and sending us out in service to share the good news of Christ wherever we go, whether it's South Sudan or just up the sidewalk. God be with you as he sends you. Let's sing our final hymn, number 658, stanzas 1, 2, and 4.